whatever this thing is, phone slash clock slash watch set to go off at 1010, which gives us 26 minutes. I want to pick up with Hrothgar's homily. Um, we talked about the beginning of it the other day where Hrothgar talks about Haramod and how the, uh, the people during Haramod's time kind of you know, betrayed him to his enemies because he didn't give rings, he didn't give treasure, he killed his own um, companions at the feasting table and such. So let's pick up with 1724. I think this is extremely important for understanding a whole bunch of stuff about this poem. And hopefully it'll be clear why. It is a wonder to say how mighty God in his great spirit allots wisdom, land, and lordship to mankind. Notice, he allots. He deals out wisdom, lordship, land to humanity. He has control of everything. Hrothgar is saying God controls the land, he controls wisdom, he controls lordship, he controls kings, he controls monsters, everything. At times, he permits the thoughts of a man in a mighty race to move in delights. Gives him to hold in his homeland the sweet joys of earth, the stronghold of men. Grants him such power over his portion of the world, a great kingdom that he himself cannot imagine an end to it in his folly. Okay? He dwells in plenty, in no way plague him, illness or old age, nor do evil thoughts darken his spirit, nor any strife or sword, hate shows itself, but all the world turns to his will, he knows nothing worse. So, once upon a time, God allows to a person, and he doesn't do this just once, he just he does it through time, allows him what? Allows him to have control of his land, control of his people. Allows him to have great thoughts. In this person, 1734, in his folly, dwells in plenty. In no way plague him illness or old age. So this is when he's younger. He's strong, he's hardy, he's hale. Nor do evil thoughts darken his spirit. That is, he has good, wholesome thoughts, let's say nor any strife or sword. He doesn't have enemies coming to attack. Okay? So, so look at the image he set up. This ruler is on the top of fortune's wheel. Everything is going perfectly for this person. At last, his portion of pride within him grows and flourishes. Notice, his portion Rothgar is saying, everybody has a portion of pride. But in this person, because he's sitting at the top of the world, it grows, it flourishes. While the guardian sleeps, the soul's shepherd. What's the guardian? What's the soul's shepherd? Uh, is it God? Does God ever sleep? Sleeping on the job that it got? No, it's not. There's a later medieval... Um, Middle English work called called soulless ward, essentially. The soul's guardian. Okay. This thing sleeps, whatever it is. That sleep is too sound. How sound? It's as sound as those Danish warriors sleeping in Herod when Grendel comes. Okay. That sleep is too sound, bound with cares. The slayer too close, who sinful and wicked shoots from his bow. Your gloss. The slayer is sin or vice. The soul's guardian is reason, conscience, or prudence. There's a big difference between reason, conscience, and prudence. Prudence is kind of more considered to be wisdom. Wisdom is not the same as conscience, right? Conscience is not the same as reason. Reason is 2 plus 2 equals 4. Whether 2 plus 2 equals 4 is wise or not, that's a stupid question. That's like saying green is sweet. 
right? So, the thing that's sleeping, I would argue, the soul's guardian is the conscience. That's the, you know, it's that still small voice that when you're getting ready to do something you shouldn't do, says, you shouldn't do it. Give us an example. And for some people, it's really still and small because it's nearly dead. For others, it's right up there, you know, so that they're plagued and can't do almost anything. We're going to see the same idea come up much, much later toward probably almost the last day of the class with the 17th century pot. All right? So, notice the slayer shoots from his bow. Yeah, well, the center of ice don't shoot from a bow. They might be shot from a bow. They might be the arrow. Okay? Then he is struck in his heart, and we get the language under his helmet with a bitter dart. The word that's translated helmet is helm. Okay? Where is this helmet? Where do you wear a helmet? On your head. That's not where this thing is. Okay? Where is this thing worn? It's on the chest. Helm simply means protector. That's all it means. So the fiery dart, or the dart, we're told, the bitter dart, is struck where? In his heart, under his helmet. Now, I'm one of, I'm not a majority, it's a minority, I think, who think the poet here is using language similar to, akin to, possibly elusive of, A-L-L, U-S-I-V-E, not E-L. Elusive of St. Paul's writings in Ephesians. Specifically, I think it's chapters 4 and 5, where he talks, says to put on the whole armor of God, including the breastplate of righteousness that will do what? Stop the fiery darts of the evil one. And the word that is translated bitter here can also be translated fiery. So, the slayer shoots a bitter or fiery dart that hits the heart. And he knows no defense. Why? Does not know God. Is it because he does not know God? He's also gone prideful into his soul where it is. His conscience is asleep. His conscience is asleep. He's unaware. Okay. Of the flourishing of pride. The strange, dark demands of evil spirits. This is what the bitter dart brings. And what are those strange, dark demands? That what he has long held seems too little. The implication is, he's held this land for a long time and it's been enough it's been fine now all of a sudden not enough he's a 20th century american gotta have more 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 what he has long held seems too little angry and greedy he gives no golden rings for vaunting boasts like Haramode. Didn't give rings. Okay. What else? And his final destiny he neglects and forgets. What's his final destiny? Yeah. I was looking for my water again. Death. So how do you forget and neglect death? I'm never going to die. I'm invincible. Emily Dickinson wrote a great little poem. Because I could not stop for death, he stopped for me. Beautiful poem. I mean, speaker is too busy. And yet, death showed up. He forgets and neglects death, meaning not prepared for it. Not prepared to die. 
So, we're told, since God, ruler of glories, has given him a portion of honors. What's the portion of honors? He's the ruler. He's young. Seemingly all-powerful. What's he thinking? I'm not going to die. I'm going to go on like this. Okay, maybe not forever. But for how long? I'm 57. According to actuarial tables, I'll probably live to be 90 or 95. I hope not. But most of you guys are 20, 22. You got another, probably, because life expectancy expanding. Well, for women, for men, it started going back the other way. 70 or 80 years. Okay? So you're thinking, I've got time to do X, Y, Z. I don't need to think about death yet. And what happens? In the end, it finally comes about that the lone, there's that word that we saw in the wanderer and the seafarer, Lana. The lone life dwelling starts to decay. That is, you get to be 57 and you hurt all the time. Your hair is gray, your body saggy, etc. That's what he means. Starts to decay and falls fated to die. Why? Because everybody is fated to die. Period. Two constants in life, death and taxes. Another follows him. Who does what? Doles out his riches without regret. The Earl's ancient treasure. So, the one who ruled for a long time, who had everything, doesn't give out rings, builds up this big hoard of treasure, dies. The person becomes king after him, opens up the treasure hoard, seemingly gives everything away. He heeds no terror. Defend yourself from wickedness, Beowulf. What wickedness? Don't be like the guy I just described. Best of men. Choose better. What's the better? Eternal counsel. Care not for pride. Eternal counsel. This is a pagan German we're talking about. They have no understanding of an eternal counsel or an eternal advice, if you want, or to choose eternity. This is the Christian poet imbuing Christian ideas into a pagan mouth. All right? Care not for pride great champion. Well, why would he be telling Beowulf this speech? <clears throat> what has Beowulf already heard twice? On the way back from Grindel's Mere after they kill Grindel, after he kills Grindel, the writers are saying, you're the greatest of earls, greatest king under the earth. You could expect somebody's had to get a little puffed up with that. He kills Grindel's mother. You're the greatest between the seas, Rothgar says. His head might get a little puffed up with that. Okay. The glory of your might is but a little while. Again, we still don't know how old Beowulf is. We know Hrothgar knew him as a boy, probably when he fostered or when he took in Beowulf's father as a refuge, refugee. Okay but we don't know when that was. The glory of your might's but a little while. And Bill was like, what are you talking about, man? I got the strength of 30 men in each man, each hand. Don't tell me my glory's but a little while. Too soon it will be that sickness, and we saw the same idea in the Wanderer, sickness or the sword will shatter, shatter your strength or the grip of fire, possibly an allusion to what will happen to Hera eventually, or the surging flood, like what was read on the hilt of the sword about the flood that destroyed the giants. Or the cut of a sword, or the flight of a spear. A terrible old age. Or the light of your eyes will fail and flicker out. In one fell swoop, death, O warrior, will overwhelm you. 
Notice, maybe you'll be lucky and live to an old age, though that wasn't considered a good way to die for a Germanic hero or an Anglo-Saxon hero. Good way to die, sword in hand on the battlefield. Look at the next line. What's the very next word? Thus. What does thus mean? What's it always mean? I saw you mouth it. Therefore. therefore. What does therefore mean? Exactly. One plus two equals. Thus I, a half hundred years, held the ring Danes under the skies. I think Rothgar was talking about himself. I was the guy who God permitted the thoughts of a man and a mighty race to move and delights, gives him to hold in his homeland the sweet joys of earth, the stronghold of man, grants him such power over his portion of the world that what? That people far and wide come and give treasure and they help me build the greatest hall of men. Notice, Greatest call of man implies what? Pride. Thus, a hundred half years. I held the ring Danes under the skies. hundred half years means how many years? Fifty years. Fifty years I ruled and kept them safe from war from many tribes throughout this middle earth. Fifty years of what kind of rule? Peace. Peace. This is a Pax Rathgarana rather than the Pax Romana or Pax Americana. This is the Peace of Hrothgar. Free from spears and swords, so that I consider none under the expanse of heaven my enemy. I didn't have any enemies. Why? They were afraid of me. And then what happened? Turnabout came in my own homeland. Grief after gladness when Grindel came. So, Hrothgar ruled for 50 years. Then Grindel came. That's 62 years. They're in the 62nd slash 63rd year. I knew him being a boy, he says. So that's sometime back there. If Beowulf was five then, and he knew him while he was in the beginning of his kingship, Okay, so let's say maybe that was 45 years ago, and then 12 years, that's 57. And if you knew Beowulf as a boy, let's say 5 to 10, take off 5 to 10, and what do you get? 47 to 52 is how old Beowulf is, possibly. That's with a bunch of ifs. In other words, he's not 20 years old. <laughs> So that when he says, yeah, in my youth, he means quite a while ago. Thus, a hundred half years I held the ring Danes under the skies, kept them safe. Turn about Cain, Grendel, the ancient adversary. For that persecution I bore perpetually the greatest heart cares. Thanks be to the creator, eternal Lord, that I have lived long enough to see that head stained with blood with my own eyes after all this strife. Why? Because what was his attitude when Grendel came? Seemingly, night after night after night after night. This will never change. This is my life. From now and evermore. And then Beowulf comes. Notice, 50 years, peace, prosperity, happiness. Grendel comes. That's the turnabout. 12 years of that. Beowulf comes. What happens? Turnabout. Notice that theme? Change. Not always change for the better, but change. No one stays at the top of Fortune's wheel. No one stays at the bottom of Fortune's wheel. No one stays in Fortune's privates, you know, Hamlet. If there's one constant in life, Heraclitus taught, it's what? Life is flux. Everything is in flux. So, Go to your seat, enjoy the feast, honored in battle. Between us shall be shared a great many treasures when morning comes. 
Why do you think it's called Hrothgar's homily? <laughs> what is the purpose of a homily or sermon? Is it to beat you down? No, it's supposed to be encouragement. It's supposed to be exhortation. What's he exhorting Beowulf to? Or not to? Do not be prideful. Don't be prideful? What else? Don't be prideful in what? Your strength. Don't trust in your strength, Beowulf. Well, what has Beowulf said repeatedly after his battles? He said it was God that decided it. wasn't me. It wasn't my hand. It was God that decided it. Okay? Well, we're going to have another big battle with Beowulf in a few moments. So, Beowulf goes and sits down. Hrothgar also sits down, line 1799, the Hall Towers. Beowulf orders the sword to be brought back to Unferth. So he brings Unferth's um, broken sword. sword back. Okay. Or he brings a sword back to him. Um, he get, Sorry, he gives Unferth his own sword. Okay. Fit 26. Beowulf says, last five minutes. We want to go home. We came what we came for. We killed Grendel. We killed Grendel's mother. Time for us to go home. So he finishes saying, let's see here. Not finishes. 1822. If ever on earth I can do anything to earn more of your affection than the battle needs I've done already, ruler of men, I will be ready at once. Text me. I'll be here. If ever I hear over the sea's expanse that your neighbors threaten you with terror as your enemies used to do, I will bring you a thousand things, heroes to help you. I have faith in Helak, the Lord of the gates, though he be young. Though he be young sounds like what? That Helak is younger than Beowulf. That's what it sounds like to me. It sounds to me like Helak is, like Beowulf is saying, Helak is younger than I am. Though he's young, it's kind of implying, you know, he's inexperienced, but he'll do the right thing. Shepherd of his people, he will support me with words and deeds that I might honor you well and bring to your side a forest of spears that support my might whenever you need men. If Hrethric, Hrethric, Beowulf, Hrothman, Unfer, Hrothgar, Hrothulf, if Hrothric, son of a prince, decides to come to the Gidish court, he will find many friends there, far off lands, or better sought by one who is himself good. If Hrothric ever comes and he needs any help, don't worry, got him covered. I think this is Beowulf's kind of gentle nod to wealthy outgoing. You don't need to worry about your boys. The wise Lord has sent those words into your heart. I've never heard a shrewder speech from such a young man. Such a young man. Well, even if he's 47 or 52, Hrothgar didn't become king when he was one. Hrothgar is probably... 80. Yeah. I've got a friend of my dad's who's not even 82, late 70s, and every now and then he'll refer to me in Facebook as young man. I'm 57. Will be in January. Yeah, but here's the thing: like, uh, Frothgar would at least have to be old enough to have at least had a reputation when he took uh, Beowulf and his father in. So, yeah. You know. So I mean, that's why I said even if he was five years into his kingship, okay, he's still thirty years older than Beowulf. So he could easily call him young man, or it could be. I'm completely bonkers with all of this. And Beowulf's only 20 years old. In which case, we have no idea how Hrothgar could have known him being but a boy. Because nothing in the poem explains that. So. Or it could be that Hrothgar's a little bit older than I, uh, you know, when he says he's in his youth, you know, and he knew Beowulf when he was a boy. He could have been a little bit older than we expected. Who could have been? Hrothgar. I don't know what you mean. 
like you know when he met Beowulf and his father, he could have been a little bit older than uh or in his uh, kingship, right? He could have been a little bit older uh, when he met them. Older than what? Older is comparative, so you have to have like, something that you're comparing it to. Like maybe like uh, thirty years in his kingship. Yeah, it could have been. But he says I was just in. I'd only recently become king at the beginning when he says that. I'd just come into the kingship, he says, when he fostered or protected Beowulf's father, okay? Which is why I think it's probably back around somewhere between the first to fifth year, because even five years in, he could consider it that. So he says, you're strong in might, sound in mind, prudent in speech. I expect it's likely that if war ever take Revel's son, Revel is, Revel's son is Helak. If he ever takes him, the people are going to make you king. Right? And you'll hold the realm, you will hold the realm of your kinsmen. Your character pleases me better and better, beloved Beowulf. You have brought it about. Here's where we find out they've been at enmity before Beowulf arrives. You have brought it about that between our peoples, the Gatish nation and the Spear Danes, there shall be peace, and strife shall rest. That's why when they land, and the Coast Guard says, who are you? Beowulf says, we're geeks, we're men of Eli. He's like, whoa, what are you doing? It's not every day that your enemy shows up to help you out. Exactly. The malicious deeds they endured before, as long as I shall rule this wide realm and treasures together. Okay? We're going to have to stop there. So I'm going to put a sticky note at 1866. Can we have two uh, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I would just suggest going over stuff. You know, good basic idea. And I don't know this from my personal practice when I was a college student. I know it from being much older and wiser later. Uh, 